Kevin Mitnick is considered one of the most wanted hackers of all time. He toyed with society, riding buses for free, intercepting phone calls, and manipulating McDonald's drive through speakers. And of course, gained unauthorized access to dozens of computer networks. But he never hacked for money, nor did anything malicious with the sensitive data he uncovered. That's why the FBI wanted to find him, so they could bring him over to their side. How many hacking tricks did he pull, and did the FBI finally catch him? Let's find out. From a young age, you could tell that Kevin Mitnick had something special about him. He'd found ways to manipulate the system and twist an arm here and there to get what he wanted. At age 12, back in 1975, while his schoolmates were paying for the bus, he already found his first way to hack society. At the time, Los Angeles Transit used a punch card system. Every time you wanted to ride the bus, your ticket would get a very specific hole. However, he noticed that all of the bus drivers used the same hole puncher. That was the only piece of information he needed. With a smile on his face, he managed to convince the bus driver that he was working on a school project. And asked for a sample hole punch and the location of where he could buy his own puncher. Now with his very own hole puncher, he went dumpster diving for unused transfer slips next to the bus company garage. From then on, he rode the bus for free. The act of tricking the bus driver actually has a name. It's called social engineering, and it's what psychologists use as a term to describe the manipulation of people into performing actions or divulging confidential information. As it turns out, Mitnick, even in the tender preteen age, was a master of it. After he'd finished up making the Los Angeles transit system his slave, he migrated to a new form of social hacking, phone freaking, with a PH. Back before the internet was widely accessible, telephones were one of the most commonly hacked technologies. Phone freaking was particularly popular from the 60s through the 80s. The hackers would learn how the phone operating systems worked and then find a way to exploit them. Phone freakers such as Kevin could collect sensitive phone numbers, mask their own phone numbers, and even charge the cost of their calls to complete strangers. Very sneaky. Mitnick could take it one step further. He'd amassed such an in-depth know-how of the phone systems that he could even imitate dial tones just by whistling. So by making a few high-pitched squeaks, he could make international phone calls without forking over a single penny. Even though he could use his societal and technological hacking abilities for all kinds of illegal activities, in his teenage years, he mostly used them for fun. With the help of his friend Lewis, Kevin decided it would be a hoot to hack into a McDonald's drive through speaker. Using a modified two-way radio, he was able to override the system. And instead of the drive through speaker directing into the cashier's headset, it directed into Kevin in the parked car across the street. This meant that he could reply to the customer's orders, pretend to be the employees, and play all kinds of pranks. When the cashier realized that something fishy was going on, he went out to investigate. When peering into the speaker, Kevin shouted through the radio, What the heck are you looking at? And, as you'd expect, the cashier got one mighty fright. So, as you've surely learned by now, Kevin Mitnick was one talented youngster who had no problem taking plenty of pleasures by manipulating systems. But let's rewind for a second. Who is this guy? Where'd he come from? And how'd he learn about all these nifty hacks in the first place? Well, we'll tell you. He was born in Van Nuys, which isn't too far from Hollywood. He attended the James Monroe High School, during which he became an amateur radio operator. This first-hand experience in the radio room is what helped him to understand how electronic wavelengths and signals worked, which correlated with the phone freaking days. The radio room would have also given him access to computer systems and software that the majority of teenagers in the world hadn't even heard of. As technology advanced, so did Mitnick's skills. It was 1979, when he was just 16 years old, that he gained his first unauthorized access to a computer network. That network belonged to a company called Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC, and he broke into their system and copied the company's software. Although this would come back to haunt him some nine years later when, spoiler alert, he was charged and convicted for it. Then in 1981, the 17-year-old Kevin and a friend named Louis DePayne hacked the mainframe Cosmos computer system for Pacific Bell, a phone company now owned by AT&T. Once Kevin had maneuvered into the mainframe, he could divert the phone lines and intercept any of the calls going through the exchange. Regular folk who used Pacific Bell service quickly started to complain about what they thought were errors and pranks. Fair enough, too, because Kevin would answer these calls himself, and he wasn't afraid to throw a few tasteless jokes around. With an obvious interest in Pacific Bell, one night, Kevin snuck into the building where Cosmos was housed. He took manuals and documents containing a stack of passwords. The plan was simple. Take the documents, photocopy them overnight, return everything exactly where he found them before morning. 
What Kevin didn't count on, however, was that Lewis was telling another friend, and that friend ratted him out to the police. This put Kevin on the watch list. Cops pulled him over the next day, and he was sentenced to three months behind bars with a year's probation. Ouch. You'd think that after winding up in prison that Kevin would have learned his lesson, but nope, entirely the opposite. Once he was released on probation, full of crazy ideas in his head, he dove straight back into the hacking pool. His next project? Hacking the NSA and listening into conversations of the world's biggest wiretappers. But it was 1983 that was perhaps his greatest hacking achievement. At the time, he was studying at the University of South California. Using one of the machines at the university, likely a TRS-80 computer system, Mitnick gained access to something called ARPANET. Think of this as one of those ancestors of the internet, except this was reserved for the army, large corporations, and universities. In other words, it was really important. Fast forward to 1987, where Kevin, along with his pal Lenny DiCiccio, gained access to the internal network of the research laboratory at DEC. This wasn't an overly complicated hack because Lenny DiCiccio actually worked there and could point Kevin in the right direction. Of course, access into the system was quickly gained. For Kevin, this time was different from the previous hacks. He wasn't infiltrating the network for fun, curiosity, or for a challenge. He had a goal, to seize the source code of a particular operating system called VMS. Mission accomplished, but again Kevin ended up being caught. Although it wasn't because of his own oversight, it's because somebody else turned him in. It was Lenny DiCiccio that betrayed him. He informed DEC about Kevin's hack into the company network, and then agreed to be an FBI informant, wearing a wire when he invited Kevin over to his house to discuss the next stage of their plan. For this crime, Kevin was sentenced to a year in prison and had to take a six-month program to treat his computer dependency. Did the program work? Not a chance in hell. After more hacks into companies like IPM, Nokia, and Motorola, more arrests, more probations, and an FBI hunt that led agents all the way to North Carolina, he was found. Following years of hiding, Mitnick was discovered and arrested in February of 1995 at his apartment in Raleigh, making the end of a well-publicized manhunt. The straw that broke the camel's back was when he hacked into the computer system of Tutsomo Shimomura, a research scientist. Shimomura, unhappy with being on the receiving end of it, traced the hack to a modem connected to a cell tower near Raleigh, and it didn't take the police long thereafter. For the hundreds of hacks that he had orchestrated over the two decades prior, Mitnick was charged with 14 counts of wire fraud, 8 counts of possession of unauthorized access devices, the interception of wire and electronic communications, unauthorized access to a federal computer, and causing damage to a computer. That's a pretty hefty rap sheet. Following his release on January 21st, 2000, Kevin met a fork in the road. He could either continue down the route he was going, hacking into companies, stealing information, and making a mockery of governments, or he could put his talents to good use. So he went full 180. Instead of working against the companies, a hobby that made him one of America's most wanted, he decided to work for them. The FBI was aware that despite Mitnick's easy access to credit cards, social security numbers, and proprietary software, he never spent a dime of other people's money. Credibility was key for his shift from the dark side to the light side. These days, Mitnick is no longer the hacker feared by governments, telephone companies, and the American public. He's working for the good guys as a paid security consultant, public speaker, and author, running his own security consultancy business that he calls Mitnick's Absolute Zero Day Exploit Exchange. Kevin offers security consulting for Fortune 500 companies and the FBI, and performs a number of security testing services for the world's largest companies. On top of that, he teaches social engineering classes to government agencies, showing them how to benefit from it, and also how to protect themselves from exploitation. True to his history, However, there's always a trick up his sleeve. The business cards he gives out at events, well, those double as lockpicking kits. Seriously though, did you expect anything less? Despite the huge manhunt and the hacking of hundreds of companies, the way Mitnick tells it, he never meant any harm. In his very own words, quote, I never in doing this wanted to harm anybody. I was just having fun. I was being the magician by breaking the systems and getting the code. That's why I was going after cell phones. That's why I was going after operating systems, to become better at hacking them, end quote. Of course, not everybody agrees with Kevin's view. He did, after all, spend five years in prison for stealing software from a range of companies, costing them hundreds of thousands of dollars. And even as early as his L.A. bus riding days, he was exploiting the best quality in people, their desire to help a fellow person. So what do you think about Kevin? Is he friend or is he foe? Let us know in the comments. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to The Richest, and thanks for checking us out. We'll see you next time.